All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. We have a jam-packed hour full of fun. Because it always takes people a few minutes to log into Zoom, they're probably in some other meeting and or Zoom is holding in the waiting room. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to try to get to know the audience a little bit. If you are part of a startup, how many people are currently on your startup team? Are you a solo founder? Is it you and a co-founder? Are there four or five of you working together to bring this idea to life? Just jump in the chat, warm up those little chat fingers and just write a number, just a single, it could be in the double digits, could be up to 10 or 12, who knows? But if you just tell me what's the size of that founding team, I'd be uh, curious to find out. While you're doing that, there you go, Iagos, thank you for that, three founders there. I'm gonna get rolling with the content. We're gonna start with a little bit about Foresight, make sure you understand our organization. Then we're gonna be diving into a fireside chat with one of our executives in residence, Yasmin Lo, as well as, I hope, uh, one of the participants from our last cohort, Sam Anderson. Uh, he's just running a little bit late there. We're gonna go through the program, a wonderful chance for you to ask questions there as well, get as many details as you like dive a little bit deeper into some of those details, and finally finish off hopefully with a lot of time for your questions. Of course, as we move throughout this program, feel free to unmute yourself. It is a relatively small, intimate room today. Uh, put them in the chat however you want. Don't wait till the end. You might forget the question, or out of context, I might not give you the answer that you really need. So feel free to just jump in at any time. That's why we have the chat box, and it looks like we've got some solo founders in there. Let's say we've got a team of two, a team of three, so great, uh, some different team sizes. Really quickly, by the end of this hour, I hope you understand what Foresight does for different ventures and whether it applies for your company and how we could help. If I haven't answered that question, please ask it at the end if you're not clear. Okay, a little bit... Uh, of time to recognize the lands on which we operate here in Canada. Foresight is a pan-Canadian organization, and so we do encourage you to recognize the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the First Nations or Métis people on which you may be operating. I myself am based in Vancouver on the traditional territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Foresight is a not-for-profit. We are mostly government funded, and our goal is to fuel the transformation to a green economy. One of the ways we do that is by helping entrepreneurs like you. The key way we do this is we are an accelerator. We run accelerator programming. We help people understand what it is they need to do to get their venture from where it is today to where it needs to be. We also run innovation challenges. We've got one right now with the Mining Association of British Columbia. We just finished a $25 million challenge off with our friends over at the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation, I'm sorry, Canadian Research Resource Innovation Network, CRIN. I'm terrible with acronyms. Luckily, it's not a big part of my job. We've run ones with Vestas around recyclable wind turbine blades, with Pepsi around water use, with Quadrial in the built environment. We have a lot of challenges open and running. Keep posted for those. And we're always looking to add more with our industrial partners. We want to kind of bring together innovation and, of course, open up industry so that they can move as quickly as we want them to. We focus on capital attraction. We realize that to see the clean tech changes we want, address the climate challenges we face, we're going to need money all the way from angel investors and seed stage all the way through to big banks and funding large projects. Export development. We want to build massive, big, beautiful billion dollar businesses because you're going to need that scale to address the climate challenges we face, right? If we solve a little problem in a little corner of Canada, that's not going to do it for the rising sea level, for the GHG emissions in other countries. We need to be looking at how we can make great ideas right here at home that will solve problems around the world. And we will help overcome those challenges with you as you go to export your technology and ecosystem building. I'll talk a little bit about how we try to convene different stakeholders to make it all easier and a smoother path. Today, we've worked with a lot of SMEs, 750. We've helped them deliver some results, hire people, 6,700 jobs created, 
raise money, $840 million in financing, sell products, $310 million in revenue from those companies, and over a billion dollars of economic impact if you roll in the challenges that we've run. We do this through a number of our regional and global partners. Clean tech isn't simple though. It's pretty fragmented. There's lots of different verticals we, we touch on. And it's really uh, underlying uh, most of economic activity. And in realizing this, we have started to take a sectoral focus. And you can sort of see a list of these sectors here from water next to power, energy, carbon, be it utilization, capture, sequestration, the built environment, the build next program, the biocircular economy, and of course, agriculture. And through our AgriNext program, there are so many opportunities to reduce pesticides, to reduce fertilizer use, to improve yields with the same sort of inputs. I want to take a minute now to spend with uh, a couple of my favorite people, Sam and Yasmin. So Yasmin Rouleau is an executive residence here at Foresight. I, I think we're so, so lucky to have her here. She's founded a few companies. She's exited successfully. She's got a wonderful view on how to create value from data, which is done uh, with a few of her businesses. She's worked internationally. And what I love is her commitment to giving back. She's so down to earth. It's absolutely just fun to listen to her talk and explain the concepts of how to think through that, those early entrepreneurial stages. Sam Anderson is the CEO at Carbon Graph. Uh, he is an expert in uh, measurement of emissions, and he's taking that to build a platform that'll make it easier for small businesses to understand the footprint that their products have, communicate the value to their customers, and provide differentiate for differentiation for themselves. Sam, did I get that kind of right? Was I on roughly on target with what yeah. I was trying to do? Yeah, 100%. Okay, fantastic. Yasmin. Were there any mistruths in what I said about you? Uh, no, I just wish I could put that on a t-shirt and walk around. Uh, <laughs> that, was a, that was a very generous intro. Thank you. Uh, really quickly, I know I've only got a few minutes with you here because you're both busy people and I've only asked you for the first 15 minutes of the hour to release you to go back to your lives, building these wonderful companies, having a massive impact. I'll start with you, Sam. You went through our fall cohort what did you like most? What did you find most valuable about the program? Um, I mean, it's difficult to understate how valuable it was for myself and for Carbon Graph to go through Foresight. We, I was um, an engineer working in the mining sector 12 months ago, uh, and I quit my job and I went full time in July of uh, 2021 on, to work on Carbon Graph. And it was only a few months later that I think we probably squeezed in at the bottom of the um, spectrum of acceptable companies into Foresight Launch and Deliver. Uh, and so it really was perfectly timed with giving me a network of um, you know, mentors, really replacing that um, network of mentors you have when you're working in a big company. And we've, um, we've seen some amazing results as well through applying what we've learned with Foresight and through some opportunities we've had directly with the program. Fantastic. And, and where is kind of Carbon Graph? I mean, you started in just July and you know, we're rolling into spring of 2022. How far yeah. have you come to date? Uh, we've come quite far. We've, we've, we're seven people now. Uh, we've got paying customers. We are actively raising our seed round. Um, we are building our technology. We're basically uh, getting to the point where there's way more to do than we can properly execute on ourselves. And so we're getting to ask for a lot of funding and help and, and asking people to join the team. So it's an exciting time. I think one of the most valuable things we got from Foresight was helping us take our mission, which is focused around an environmental outcome, helping to reduce carbon emissions and figure out what type of scalable business model needs to be built around that to preserve the mission, but to make it effective and to make it grow um, beyond just being a, a nonprofit endeavor. And that you know, that is essentially what's at the core of Foresight and uh, has helped us a lot. Profitable, scalable business models. That's music in my ears. And I saw Yasmin perk up when you said that. <laughs> um, I, I kind of want to, I gave a little bit of your background. Feel free to sh share any more details, but 
How do you sort of bring in, Sam mentioned the value of having a team of moderators, folks who've done it before. How do you bring some of your experience into your role as an executive resident? For, for sure, you know, it's, it's first of all, it's so incredible uh, to be in EIR with this group because you see companies at all different stages. And the, the key that, uh, you know, gets me excited is I get to share the scar tissue. Uh, you know, yes, I can say I've had a couple of really successful exits, but I've also had a ton of learning and a few companies that failed miserably. And so those learnings that I was able to um, garner from that, it's been exciting to be able to share that with the, the launch participants um, because you're not gonna get it right out of the gate. And there were many times that I, I was 100% sure that when we pressed live on our algorithm or on our offering, we'd have every LOI convert to paying customers. And you know, in one of my companies, we did that. I even bought a cowbell because I was gonna hit it every single time a new customer came on. And I don't think I hit it once. Um, and um, and and just how to actually internalize that and not take it as a failure, but actually take it as insight. And I think the launch program allows for us uh, as EIRs, but also as cohort members to, to try and rejig and try and kind of rephrase uh, some of the learnings that they're having, that are that they're obtaining into actionable items and uh, and that's where I get to get really excited to be in EIR is you know keeping everyone's socks up in some regard <laughs> right uh, there's a particular moment in uh, the program where you're doing customer discovery and uh, and this goes over a few weeks and I, I feel like that's probably the most valuable exercise in the entire program because we have so many assumptions that the customer is going to love what we want and what we're offering and sometimes we get on these calls and realize oh shoot I got to do customer education and what does that actually mean um, how do I get them to have the same aha that uh, that we had to build our product and so that's exciting and and I think that as an EIR um, I just find it fascinating Fantastic. Um, Yasmin, what do you think is, is that most important thing to make a venture successful? Heart. Uh, I, I, I honestly, that's, that's what I can say. I mean, right now in my life, I, I do a lot of due diligence for funds and I, I'm, I'm actually building a fund. And that is the, that is the theme that comes all the way uh, along it. You know, you can have the best business case and the best business plan, but without that heart, which is uh, the heart to be a learning self, the heart to see this through, uh, the heart to be empathetic with your team, um, all of these types of skills that just make us good humans, I, I think are, are a massive uh, important piece. And of course, having a smart business idea is, is, is really important, but being able to kind of roll with the punches, I think, I think that's, a, that's a, big, a big deal for me. Um, I think the other, the other big thing for me is, you, you said it in my bio, I mean data. I think a lot of companies um, don't realize that uh, they have so much valuable data. And so I, I always encourage companies to really step ba back and look at kind of their entire business model and figure out where uh, they can also um, leverage some of the learnings that they're having in more formalized data strategies, so. Fantastic, thank you so much. Sam? What is it? I mean, you know, you're you're less than a year into this thing, but I think you've done fantastic progress in having paying customers and growing your team. If you had something to share that you made a huge difference for you that you wish you'd known back in July, <laughs> what would it be? Well, I mean, we could sit here till the end of the meeting um, if I was going to list all of those things. I think, just long, um, just long. <laughs> you know. Yasmin's comment about heart being important, I resonate a lot with that. I think at the end of the day, there's gonna be so many successes and failures that are somewhat out of your control and you, you have to have the um, emotional strength and the emotional support network to be able to weather all of that, the ups and the downs. For me, what's been really valuable is thinking about trying to build a massive company is kind of like grasping at this future vision that maybe will work and building a 1% chance or a 10% chance of achieving that vision could have a massive impact, but it's also very intangible. So some of the things that I've actually been most proud of has been 
you know, the co-op students that we've employed and we've given them a full work term and they've been able to put carbon graph on their resume and go on and get other jobs or, um, you know, positive impact we've had for the other small businesses that we're working with as customers now. Those are very like tangible benefits and things that I'll be proud of, even if we're totally unsu unsuccessful in, you know, building a, a venture scale business. Fantastic. It reminds me of that little saying, a uh, journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. If you keep your keep your eyes on you know the road right in front of you, you'll you'll go far. That actually is the 15 minutes. Uh, I wish I could spend more and, and obviously dig into more of those lessons that you've had, Sam. Hopefully we can do that and, and maybe keep the lessons less painful in the future here as Foresight continues to support Carbon Graph. Um, but Yasmin, Sam, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time here today to share. Thank you so much. And, and I cannot say enough. I'd love to see um, all of you uh, in, uh, in the launch program as an EIR. So uh, good luck and have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I second that 100%. Definitely apply. Um, and we're actually in the Earth Tech program now, which is also run by Foresight. So we've stayed with the gang and are still involved for the foreseeable future and probably for years to come. I, I hope so. Get into that grow program once you hit a million dollars a year. I'll let you know. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Zach, you had a question about on my little map, where is clean tech? Clean tech is in each of those areas, right? So we have certainly a general clean tech uh, approach for all the companies, no matter what they're what they kind of offer. And then we just have those specific sector streams because we find there's a lot of uh, focus on that, either from the industry in Canada or the companies that we see. Does that kind of answer your question? Uh, yes and no. Um, yes, in a way that what you're saying is true. No, uh, when you look at many of the corporations like Crown Corporations, and they have the list of industry where they have a drop down, uh, many times you don't find clean tech uh, as been registered there. I have pointed out to, for example, Octea, which is uh, Ontario Clean Tech Association that I'm a member of or Toronto Board of Trade, or even when we apply for small business uh, grant during the COVID-19 period, we could not qualify because there was no particular area that we can indicate ourselves for what we are doing. So in many ways, if you're looking at it, uh, what I'm trying to highlight right now is that uh, if clean tech is the way forward and can engage globally as much as we can do many things locally for the either for climate change impact or food waste uh, securities or food security or any of those solutions that we what many of us are providing if those things are not recognized and it becomes you know it feels it feels bad that we are not being recognized for what we're yeah. doing no i i hear what you're saying zach and, and uh now i would just sort of say you know you do have to meet your customers where, where they are. And so if they see your clean tech solution in as being in the water space, or they see it for the built environment, they see it as ICT. I mean, we have companies that are trying to revolutionize that or part of the you know, renewable power. You know, we kind of have to meet people with their view of the world and uh, can't always change them to ours. And um, there's a question from Yegos about who we support, where, when, and how which actually was our next slide. So Zach, I completely agree with you. I would love to see more recognition for clean tech um, broadly. I think there is a growing conversation around it and we are trying to push that. I'll talk a little bit about how we engage other community members as well to build that momentum. Here's our program ramp, right? Uh, I like to sort of in with no, there's some fantastic accelerators out there, but we don't really take a baby bird model. Right? We don't want to help you out for a few months and then kick you out and see if you can fly. So we actually work all the way from the ideation stage with our Kickstart program to the validation stage, our launch and deliver programs. We have a pilot program, right? Because we were noticing some companies were getting stuck with good technology, getting it out into the field and deploying it in that first kind of sales piloting conversation. Then we have our growth programming for companies that have a million dollars of revenue a year and are suffering those scaling challenges. I hate to tell you, 
it actually doesn't get any easier. You have to continue learning throughout the process. You have to continue personally growing and we wanna continue supporting ventures through that. So some of the companies we're working with like Clear started at the ideation stage. It was one founder, Gareth Brown, coming in saying, I think I can do something in the wind space, renewable power, I can help optimize it. I love his story because he had the least attractive value proposition. I can help wind turbines generate 1% extra electricity. Doesn't sound that special, but if you think about it, if you go to a large operator, that means that they built, for every 100 wind turbines, they put up another wind turbine. They saved a couple million dollars and they get 100% profit out of that 1%. They're already doing all the operations and maintenance. So his software is super profitable with a great ROI and he's seen massive success. He's up over 100 employees now with Clear. He's making a big difference in terms of the efficiency of renewable power. So there's a good environmental impact story to it. And he's been through each of the stage of our programming. So really happy to see him do well with that and see that, again, growing globally. He's working with wind turbines in Australia, in South America, in Europe. It's a fantastic kind of example of what we do there. I'm going to dive into each of these programs a little bit more as we get into that, uh, the detailed portion of it. But that's kind of the highlight of where we support people. We support people wherever you happen to be today, whether you're just starting out or whether you've already got a bunch of revenue. We are supported by, as I mentioned, we're not-for-profit, Western Economic Development Canada, which recently split into Prairies Canada, Pacific Canada, or Pacific Canada and Prairies Canada, for those who are paying attention. Innovate BC, Baskins is a wonderful law firm, RBC Foundation with our Accelerate from Anywhere programming, and the National Research Council of Canada are some of our funders. I mentioned we have 150 global partners. Here are some of them. We work with other accelerators. I mentioned you might jump into other accelerators at different points because they've got a good network of folks to talk to as well. They might regionally be more plugged in than we are. If you wanna go down to Houston in the oil and gas industry, Unique is a wonderful place to go. If you happen to be doing built environment stuff in Winnipeg, North Forge, that's the wonderful yellow NF logo there. That's a good place for you to head. We also work with universities, UBC, uh, Guelph, UVic, SFU. We want to have the broadest network to plug you into the services you need. If it's piloting at a, a polytechnic, if it's research validation uh, connections, whatever it is you need, that's why we've put together this network of supporting uh, partners. Our Helix 5 model. Right? We started out with the innovators. They're in the middle of the circle. That's where we started. That's where we want to stay focused on bringing new technologies into the market. But we realized pretty quickly it wouldn't happen as fast as we wanted and definitely not as fast as you want it to have happen unless we, again, build links with other groups. We started off with industry. I talked a lot about our challenge programs. We also realized we need to have friends in academia. We need to make sure that the thousands of really smart people in academia and the millions of dollars of equipment that they have are available to you to test and validate your products. We need to be talking to government. The Canadian government is fantastic at supporting early stage startups. If you join our programs a couple times a year, we run our Innovator Support Day where we get 10 federal agencies together to tell you how it is they support you, right? What stages of business, what programs they have, how they can show that you're capital efficient by leveraging that non-dilutive funding that they have. And then the investors, we wanna make sure that we have good relationships with them to save you time. When you need to go get money, we have a list of people and we can help match you with their thesis, be it the stage of business you're at, be it the type of product that you have or the industry that they're targeting. So that's kind of the groups. And we want to convene those. We want to bring them together to break down those silos. So they're sharing the stories and interesting in, sorry, their interests so that everything moves a little bit more quickly and cleanly. So that industry is sharing with investors what it is they care about. So when they see a company solving that problem, they know and understand the value that it brings. That they can communicate back to academia what sort of research is required. We want this whole thing moving more quickly and smoothly. And that's where we want to play a role as a convener. If you're wondering whether you're a clean tech company, 
I will give you Forsyth's definition. We actually borrow it from our friends in the federal government. It is any product, process, or service that has a positive environmental impact, which is a very broad definition. I usually think of it in four main waste streams or four kind of categories, GHG emissions. If you reduce GHG emissions, you either abate them, you make sure they never happen in the first place, you remove them, anything to do with that in a positive way, you're clean tech. Water, if you treat water, you reduce water usage, you're a clean tech company. Waste streams, if you're recycling any waste, if you're reducing the amount of materials that go into products, anything where you can measure it in kilograms of material avoided, that's clean tech. And the last one is energy efficiency. If you can stop people from using power, either kilowatts, joules, uh, British thermal units, any way you wanna measure that energy, anything to do with energy efficiency, be it a software program or a new type of insulation, you are a clean tech company. We have worked with clean tech companies that are in the fracking space. They make fracking more efficient. We have a requirement for those energy streams at this point, and then we need to do it as cleanly as possible. So if you're wondering whether you're a clean tech company, we be happy to have a conversation with you, but hopefully that gives you a broad bucket of, uh, of understanding of what we see as clean tech. Diving into our programs, diving into what we do as an accelerator. Really quickly, we've got the community of innovators. This is everybody who cares about clean tech. If you know anybody who cares about clean tech and wants to learn more about clean tech, have them join our community of innovators. They can get onto our Slack channel. They can get access to our newsletter. They can get access to some of our events and they'll get learning. So if you know someone who's doing their graduate studies or postgraduate work or they're a professor or they're a lawyer, but they really care about clean tech and wanna get involved, that's what the community of innovators is for. It's completely free. And again, to Zach's point, we wanna build that momentum and knowledge of what the clean tech industry is all about. The venture community, you have to have started a company in clean tech. So a little bit of a more narrow group, still free, but we want to add value and build that network and bring everyone in the Canadian clean tech ecosystem working as a startup together. We're bringing affiliate discounts. So we're talking to folks like Amazon Web Services. I think they can give you up to $100,000 of free cloud computing. Everybody's probably using cloud computing in some way or another. Uh, HubSpot for marketing, and CRM purposes, and all sorts of affiliate discounts available there. You can get access to our workshops and we do run our monthly fireside chats, which you can drop into. So these are uh, information webinars. We bring in experts to talk on everything from employee stock options, the state of the funding markets, the cybersecurity. We actually poll the venture community and say, what is it that you wanna learn about? And we will bring in an expert to talk about that. Finally, the deepest in involvement you will have with Foresight is as a program participant. So either in any of those core courses, uh, kickstart, launch, deliver, grow, whatever the case may be, this is where you get to work with folks like Yasmin Rouleau, people who have done it before, people who have an insight into what can go right and sometimes what can go wrong. That's the kind of involvement in the program. Uh, briefly, I'll talk a little bit about the workshops. Generally, we run them around topics like investor readiness, uh, sales and business development, marketing and branding, uh, HR. They're really designed for the topics that you might need as your company is growing. So our core courses are what we believe at your stage of business you absolutely need to know, right? but you might not be raising money now. You might not raise money for six months or a year. And so we don't want to put all that information into a core course. It's really focused on how you're going to get the technology and the commercial side of your business, right? Whenever you need to know about raising money, we run workshops on a regular basis to help you make sure you're prepared for that. But time is your most valuable asset, so we don't want you wasting it taking an HR course if you're not hiring anybody, right? Wait until you really need that info. Jump into the workshop at that time. And of course, our executives and residents and mentors are there to help tailor the content and support you on an ongoing basis. We also put a lot of our information into our online learning management system, so it's available whenever you need it. All right, 
diving a little bit into the programs here, kickstart, that's when you're at the ideation stage. That's where you really need to figure out whether this idea is a valid business, whether there is a problem solution fit. So it's not yet a product market fit. It's just whether there's really a customer problem out there that your solution is resonating with. We'll give you the tools to, to go through that. All of our programs are designed to be tactical. This is not an academic exercise. We want you to have things that you can apply in your business right away. And we try to build them around tools that we want to see you use again and again and again. Imagine this like golf clubs. You're going out to play a game of golf. We're going to teach you how to use the putter and the driver and your irons. And you're going to use them a lot. Right? You're not going to put them away. Ah, you know, I used my putter on the first hole. I'm going to throw it away. Never going to use it again. Nope, you're going to use that on 18 holes. So the things we're teaching you here are ways you can continue to look at and analyze your business. Some of our executives and residents are consultants and they work with firms in the five to $50 million range. And these are the tools that they work with those executive teams on, on a quarterly or annual basis, right? They say, let's pull out the putter. How are we gonna hit our goals for this quarter? Let's look at what we've learned. Let's assess where the business is really at. And so you're gonna be using those tools throughout all the programs. And Kickstarter really is around the value proposition canvas. We move into the launch program. That's a little bit more about the business model canvas delivers about the technology development roadmap and the grow program uh, is a little bit more tailored. Once you get up over a million dollars, we really are starting to look at how the team works together. Any questions? Am I moving too quick? I feel lonely. I'm the only one unmuted. All right. I have one question. Sure. Uh, uh, it's not basically a question. It's basically uh, a, a good way to, I mean, like what I'm looking at, the kickstart, uh, what I've been involved in uh, for the last few weeks, um, definitely helped me to understand or go to the phase of being launched or deliver. So it's, it's, a, it's, been, a, it's been quite a good journey. Um, I've been appointed as an advisor for CSI and Toronto, Toronto mm -hmm. chapter. But despite the fact that I may have that information or that number of years of background of whatever I might be doing it, but I found the kickstart what uh, what I'm doing right now with, with Foresight, it has definitely helped me a lot to understand a better delivery for launch. Yeah. Also, no, thank you, Zach, thank you very much. And I think while I would say our target customer is really a first time entrepreneur. We get fantastic feedback from folks who've done it before, who really appreciate going through the exercises, getting the feedback on it. Um, and, and it has as much value for them as it does for earlier stage ventures. Yagos, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one. You might be talking about it later on. So, you know, all, all this looks quite exciting. So, um, is there any cost to the programs or uh, are there any investments tied into it, i.e. any equity, uh, you know, sharing types of scenarios? You know, I, this reminds me a bit of CDL programs. So, yeah, just, you know, if you could speak a bit more, you know, what are the, you know, what are the conditions on that, on that side of the story? Absolutely. Have you been through CDL? Uh, nope. Okay. Um, so we are not for profit. Uh, we do not take any shares at this time. There is no funding. So I think you mentioned investment. So we don't, you know, uh, I know Techstars would give you a hundred or $150,000 for five or 7% of your company or something around there. We don't give you money. We don't take equity. We will ask you to pay a fee. In the Kickstart program, it's $100 a month. In the Launch and Deliver program, it's $200 a month. And over in the Grow program, after your million dollars in revenue, we will charge you $500 a month. This does not represent near the cost of delivery of these programs. Again, they're heavily uh, funded by the government to deliver these programs. 
but we want to make sure that you do value what you are receiving and that you do contribute a little bit to uh, the, the costs of, of what you're receiving. Um, so we actually get fantastic uh, discounts from all of our suppliers, our mentors, our executives and residents. They are all working consultants. We do pay the executives and residents, but not near their consulting rates. So they give us a wild discount. We then subsidize that further for you. You're going to pay in you know, a launch program, 200 bucks a month, and you're easily going to get access to two to $3,000 a month of value in terms of if you were to hire consultants to do those things. Sam, you have a question? Yeah, I have a, a question. Thank you, Stephen, for uh, the presentation. And I was looking at uh, the definition of a clean tech company that you provided there. And we check all of the boxes. I'm uh, the CEO of Compound Connect. Uh, and I had um, I wanted to bring up sort of the, the issue that I'm struggling with here that I think that Foresight might be uh, a good fit for helping me resolve. So what we're doing is applying uh, machine learning processes to ecosystem data in order to improve the efficiency of the tools and technologies used in environmental research, specifically to microplastics. So for regular plastics, they can identify the type of plastic and sort it by a sort of computer vision process and some other processes. But when it comes down to the microplastics, these fine little fibers and beads and powders sort of, uh, sort of composition, it, they're not able to do it the same way. So they use these chemical microscopes uh, and the data that comes out of that is difficult to read and tell what type of plastic we're looking at. The reason is because the, uh, the environmental weathering changes how the, how the plastic, um, the composition is sort of chemically. So what we're doing is improving the way that that uh, is interpreted so that you can tell what type of plastic it is, even if it's been weathered uh, by these processes by applying machine learning. The issue that we're having is to, sorry, did you have a, a question there? No, nope. what was the issue you're having? The, the issue we're having is to access specifically th this type of data. A lot of it seems to be tied up in institutions. Um, you know, like we're, we're trying to figure out a way to get uh, these cleanup recycling crews to be able to get this plastic to labs who'd be interested in doing the, uh, the, 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 the spectroscopy, uh, the microspectroscopy, it's, it's a specific sort of thing. We need to develop a, a research, I don't wanna say consortium necessarily, and like not setting up a separate entity necessarily, but just sort of like a group project. And to be able to get this sort of data, it just seems that there's a bit of institutional gatekeeping that there are projects within universities that seem to have quite a lot of this data, but they're not making it public. And it's difficult to be able to access this as, as a company in Canada, it seems. So so in terms of just being able to access bigger uh, data to, to really improve these tools and technologies for environmental research at a corporate level, we're having some, some trouble with that. So I'm wondering if that's something that you have heard about before and, and maybe have uh, helped people identify some solutions for that. Uh, yes and yes. And if you'd like me to go into details, yes, we've run into folks who need data and other groups don't want to share it, the people who own it. I think Yasmin was saying, hey, she encourages everyone to look at the value of their data. Unfortunately, some people do look at the, their data and say, this is really valuable, so I'm not going to give it away or share it. Uh, yes, we have some experience in other startups, uh, small, medium enterprises, facing those challenges. And we have some executives and residents who can talk you through some strategies around what you can do there. Um, just as a quick note, you use they a lot, and I don't actually know who would pay you for these results, but that's that's not, that's another that's another part of the conversation, right? Um, well, I'm, I mean, I could speak to that. We're in a, a product development phase for a product that would be um, useful in environmental research, in uh, recycling, in quality uh, control for food and beverage. There's there's all sorts of um, well, water and waste uh, regulators as well. There's all sorts of um, industry applications that we've identified for this. It's just a matter of improving our product so that it uh, it, it has a um, an, an output that 
is reliable for these uh, for for these industries. And in order to get there, we just need to have more data to feed into the algorithm for the, the machine learning process. So really, we're in uh, product development, and there's we we think we see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of um, in terms of um, the the market application and, and sort of our, our value proposition to the market uh it, it's just it's a matter of getting there getting to that finish line and not getting usurped by these other institutions that have a lot more access to those resources in the meantime yeah so like i say i mean it, it's not uh my my background or ballywick i know that we've worked with other companies on how to negotiate that i know that some of our executives and residents have deep ties with some of the universities, some of the professors at uh, U of C, UVic, UBC, SFU for decades and have connections to different deans that might be able to loosen up some professors or some research groups to work with you. Um, also, you know, NSERC, NRC, uh, different federal research organizations, uh, we can see how we can help you get access to the data you need. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we want to get involved with NSERC and in science and innovation, but to be eligible for those, they're looking for either uh, institutions that are already academic, uh, or they're looking for research groups. And it's sort of we're, we're in that phase of be, trying to put together that group uh, to be eligible for for those uh, specific grants. Yeah. But I appreciate that answer. Yeah, my time. Yeah, there's, there's tons of Tons of people looking to help, and yeah, uh, sometimes it's, it's having the connections and knowing who is doing that research and interested in, and wants to lend some grad students and you can get access to their data. And then how you're going to work the IP. Different universities have different IP rules, uh, so you're going to want to work with the ones that are more friendly, right? So that uh, at the end of the research project, usually NSERC or MyTax will help you negotiate uh, reasonable access to that for commercial purposes, but. Um, certainly something you, we can discuss more at length uh, when we get you uh, into one of the programs and hooked up with the, the right EIR to help you do those things. Well, we we did a, an accelerate uh, my tax accelerate uh, grant uh, project. We just wrapped that up recently, and it actually went uh, really well. And um, yeah, I was I was happy with with uh, their policies. They, they sort of uh, leave it to the institutions in terms of what the if they already have an IP policy, and if there isn't, they're sort of more. Uh, just try to be more friendly to the business side. So my tax is, is quite good. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, I go some Sammy, both still have your hands up, but I'm assuming I've answered your questions. If not, let me know. I'll go. Oh, yeah. So, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Um, just in case you still have a question, I don't want to miss it. Uh, our approach to teaching or in, your, in our approach to learning. We try to put as much online as possible because we want to be respectful of your time. We don't want to be hogging up four and eight hour sections of days. All of the learning is online. Everything is tactical. Everything is built around exercises that make you think about, analyze, or can apply to your business right away. We bring you together in small groups so that you can actually network with other folks at a similar stage of business. This is going to be really valuable. We have very experienced mentors. They might not have a good opinion on what CRM system you should use. They might not know who the best IP lawyer is in your backyard. The other entrepreneurs working at that same stage of business will be able to help answer those questions for you. Also, we want you to see how they're approaching it. You're going to get to see how other entrepreneurs are solving their problems, how they're presenting and telling their story. We want to give you the opportunity to learn from that. We want you to also critically evaluate what they're doing and give them feedback, right? So in terms of, we want you to learn about a topic like your value proposition. We want you to make your own value proposition. We want you to critique other people's value propositions because as you get comments, feedback from angel investors, co-founders, employees, you're gonna to need to be very practiced in how to take in that information from other folks and also give back that information and say, thank you for that feedback. I will incorporate these parts of it or whatever the case may be, right? Um, you will also need to work with your co-founders on how they want to see your value proposition. So we want you practicing those skills. It's also going to deepen your recollection of it and your understanding of the material. So in a time efficient way, we're making sure that you get the most out of it. We also give you one-on-one -on -one EIR support, somebody who has done it before, somebody like Yasmin Zubo, 
but in other segments, we have people with a chemistry and plant backgrounds. We have folks who have done business to consumer products. We have a lot of different EIRs, over 130 people on our advisory network. They will make sure that you are taking these concepts and applying it to your business in the best way possible. So that's a little bit of our approach. I'll dive quickly through some of the programs in a little bit more depth. The Kickstart program, again, all of those four basics. So it's a structured program, comes with expert advice, and it's really meant to help you quickly assess whether there's problem solution fit or what are the gaps in your understanding around that. The uh, six week program, you meet once weekly for an hour with the group. You're really focused on the value proposition canvas and the customer development model. How are you going to quickly iterate, form hypotheses, communicate them to potential customers, get their feedback, go back and, and iterate again until you really understand what is the job they're doing, what is the pain they have, what are the gains they're looking for, and what does your solution need to meet? It's also going to help you understand different customer segments. Sometimes we lump a bunch of customers together, like I'm going to sell to all Canadians. Well, you're going to have a lot more umbrella sales in Vancouver than you are in Churchill, Manitoba, where you're going to be selling you know, big parkas. Uh, it's, not, it's not surprising to me that Canada Goose was founded in Manitoba because it's really cold there, right? So you can't lump people together. You have to understand what they care about and differences, and you're only going to do that through talking to them. In terms of the launch program, again, the same best basic elements, but now we're looking at a little bit wider. What we're looking at is that entire business model canvas, right? So who are the key, what are the key resources and activities that are going to help you differentiate yourself? How are you going to build and maintain customer relationships? What are you going to be your channel, channels to market, right? So now we know we're selling umbrellas to people in Vancouver. Are we doing it online? Are we doing it through uh, retail stores? Are we doing it? door to door? Are we having special clubs? What are the channel, channels that you're going to use to reach your customers? And that will change different parts of your business. How are you thinking about when it comes to revenue and pricing if you do have distributors in that channel matrix? We also want to start talking about the company maturity level. Right? Product is one of the eight categories in the company maturity level. Sometimes folks say, I'm not sure why I'm not getting investors. If you're a solo founder, investment groups realize that big companies have thousands of employees. You have to have a team to get lots and lots of work done. So how are you bringing other team members on? I remember a conversation I had with someone who said, we have five PhD chemists. We have a really strong team. And I said, you are never going to win the Stanley Cup with five goalies. You need different strengths on your team. How are you assessing that? This canvas will help you, or this model will help you look at your team, the product, your value proposition, your market entry, how you're gonna scale, how you're gonna exit, what your product is. Product is only one of these eight categories. Lots of people focus overly on that product, right? Your business, if you look at what Microsoft is, got lots of products, but they can crank out new products in a short period of time. What matters is that they understand the market and they've got the systems around it to make it all work. The Deliver program, you've figured out what you need to do through Kickstart and Launch. Now you need to figure out how you're going to do it. If you've never taken this path before, there are a lot of missteps you can take. We use the same model. We bring in CTOs, people who have commercialized technology before to help you assess the unknown, unknown risks. They're the ones that are going to hurt you. We want to help you move faster by removing some of the speed bumps to make sure you don't make bad decisions, straighten out that road, remove those hairpin turns so you don't have to backtrack, come up with a clear plan that gets you from where you are today to where you need to be for your next milestone activity, be it a fundraising event, a commercial launch, whatever that case may be. That's what the Deliver program focuses on. And as I mentioned earlier, it uses the technology development roadmap. So this is gonna be mapping what you're doing at a bunch of different stages, right? From here's my little pilot plant, I'm gonna make one gram of my uh, magic elixir to I'm gonna make a kilogram in batch process, so I'm gonna make a K 
kilogram in a continuous process. So I'm going to scale up to hundreds of tons of days, and it's going to take me six steps to do it. Here are the different resources I need in terms of engineers, mechanical, chemical, electrical, whatever they may be. Here's the IP that comes out of it. Here's the budget and resources. And this planning will help you communicate how long it's going to take you to get there. And that sort of information will really help with the credibility with all of your stakeholders, investors, government, underwater funders, employees, right? Helping them understand what that path is going to look like is really, really valuable. And bouncing it off folks who've done it before is invaluable. And we'll mention now that in this upcoming cohort, we are running a special stream of activities, our Agronext series of events. Amanda, did you want to talk a little bit about the fun and excitement that comes with Agronext? Yeah, for sure. Agronext will be six sessions that run alongside the cohort where we'll bring in industry partners to discuss topics such as reducing agriculture's carbon footprint across Canada, precision agriculture and digital data robotics and automation, circular food waste and packaging, regenerative agriculture, integrating ESG, GHG, SDG, and planning meaningful, meaningful impacts at scale, and also carbon capture and trading. So lots of exciting topics that'll be covered in those sessions that are focused towards the agri-tech sector. What we wanna do in our next streams is provide you an insider's understanding of a market or business. Right? If you understand the value chain and the different players, you can move more quickly to a successfully commercialized product. We're focused on agriculture next. We'll be doing the built environment and the water sector in the fall, and then we'll be coming back to carbon and the biocircular economy next January. If you're part of Foresight's programs, you can jump into these whenever it suits you. I would suggest you not wait for the one to participate in a launch or kickstart cohort. Get the information you need as soon as possible so you make great decisions. So your company moves as quickly as possible. You can always jump into the session of these that applies to you when it comes up. That's kind of the end of my presentation. I think we've got eight minutes left. If you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Elaine. You were hi. fast to on the draw. Hi. Hey, Elaine. Hi, hi, nice to see you. I'm a new EIR in the program. And I thought it might be useful for you to share how does Foresight select the companies, I know companies can apply to be part of the program, but how do you uh, basically filter through or, or decide who, who can actually participate? Absolutely. That is a great question. If you're interested in the program, I am I have no doubt that Lee's probably already shared it, but she'll share it again. It's our application form. You put that in online. We'll reach out and schedule an intro call with you if you like, or we can go straight to an intake process. Three of our executives and residents will meet with you. It's going to be a 45-minute meeting. We send you a little template. You fill out. It takes about 10 minutes to present, then they have a half-hour discussion with you. The goal of that meeting is to assess where you are and what you need to do next. Right? If you get accepted into Foresight's programming, we do have a limited number of spaces. We take those companies that we think have the best chance of making a difference for Canada, which would be growing to a strong company that hires people and drives a sustainable uh, economic model for us, as well as addressing the climate challenges we face, right? So if you happen to have a solution for the uh, you know, carbon emissions, that'd be good. Silver bullets are welcome. I'm told they're not going to exist, but I'm always hopeful, uh, as well as your chance of success, right? So if you've got a strong team with a good advisory board, uh, that's going to reflect well on, uh, on an application. We deal with lots of solo uh, founders and help you build the structure around yourself. The reason they're looking for how they can help is because we need to match you with an executive in residence who's going to help you. It might be based on industry. If you're in the water sector and we, and we feel you need a water expert who's going to help you with your value proposition, that's what, what we'll match you with. If we feel that you really just need to do the customer discovery, I have some folks who are absolutely fantastic at that early stage of business of understanding customers' problems, we might assign you to someone there. If you happen to be raising a million dollars, that's the first time you've ever done it, we've got some wonderful CFOs who can help hold your hand through that confusing and potentially painful process. So it depends on where you are and what you need. And that's what those executives and residents are trying to suss out. Where you are, how we can help. 
what we would need to do for you and whether you're kind of the best fit for our program. Did that answer your question? Elaine? You bet. I think it was really for everyone's benefit. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. Thanks, Steve. I might include a slide on that next time. Thank you, Elaine. Yagos, you had another question? Yeah, just to follow up on, 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 on what you what you explained about the cost. So you said it's hundred dollars per month for the Kickstarters. Just uh, to confirm, how long is the program, Kickstarter specifically? Yeah, so the Kickstarter program, we give uh, two months of EIR support. So it's going to be a two month program at the end of which we evaluate what comes next. So for the folks who participated in our winter cohorts, they started in January. Many of them are moving on to our launch program, which is starting in April. Uh, some mm -hmm. of them, it's kind of been assessed that they really need to spend more time doing the customer discovery. Some mm -hmm. industries, it's hard to do customer discovery. To get contacts and talk to folks at utility companies, it's not a quick conversation. It's easy to have 100 conversations if you've got a consumer product. It can be very hard if you're a startup in the utility space to have all the conversations you need and really drive down to the value. So some people need to spend a little bit more time at that kickstart stage of, of business. Launch is a three month program. At the end of the three months, we each evaluate whether you wanna stay in a residency program. Uh, again, we don't wanna, if, if you're a foresight company, we wanna stay with you for the journey and support you along the way with resources and access to the advice that you need. Our residency program after that initial three months is a quarterly meetup with an advisory board. So we form an advisory board for you to give you that board experience, to have a group of professionals reviewing your strategic direction, giving you accountability, making sure you're setting goals for your 90 day uh, sessions and reviewing that with you. It also is gonna build board skills in you. Again, we wanna see big, beautiful billion dollar businesses. That means you might have to have a big corporate board. You're going to need to know how to walk into a room with people and get an answer that you need to your problems. Not let them just question you. You don't want to be on the defensive. You want to have a goal. You need to manage the conversations. And if you've never had that experience, it's something that we want to build through our advisory boards. It's much, much easier to learn at Foresight, where again, we're a not-for-profit with no equity, then after somebody's put a million dollars in your business and their career reputation at their fund is on the line, stress will be high. Practice with us. Arjun, uh, you had a question? Yeah, uh, I'm at a point where I'm building my prototype before I go and fundraise. Uh, is it a good time for me to apply or should I apply after I'm, I've built my prototype and I'm ready to fundraise? Apply I now, Arjun. The things, you know, the better thinking and planning you do, the fewer mistakes you will make. The more information you can get as early as possible, the better. That is always actually the challenge that we have is saying, I wish we could tell them all this stuff. I mean, we have CFOs with 20 years of experience who say, I wish I could spend a month just working with this person so that they know how to go through their raise. Um, and we see that on the commercial side, the technical development side, the financing side, all of those pieces, there's things that you don't wanna make a mistake about. I don't know what those things are, but I don't want you to make any mistakes. So I would highly recommend that you apply now. If you're designing your prototype, that's great. Again, we try to design the programs to be time efficient for you so that you can continue working and building your prototypes, talking to customers, doing everything else you need. That's why it's just an hour or 90 minutes a week of in-class time, plus a half hour, an hour meeting with an advisor. Okay. Uh, does uh, location play a factor at all in your selection process? No, it doesn't. We are paying Canadian. We do everything virtually for the reason that we want to support all Canadian clean tech businesses. There's actually, I think, a big value to being in group across Canada. I've seen people in BC get introductions to potential customers in the Maritimes, folks in the prairies, introducing to people to, uh, from Ontario to potential funding opportunities with local uh, groups. It's absolutely fantastic to get in and mix it up in a virtual environment with you know, 20 or 30 other entrepreneurs from across the country. So where you're from does not matter to us. We do have some of our funding partners. I think I mentioned RBC uh, funds the Accelerate From Anywhere portion of our 
programming that will support you. Thank you. Where are you from, Arjun? Uh, I'm located in uh, Montreal right now, but I started off the business in Victoria. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Well, uh, if they still run Formula One weekend, I'll have to come visit. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, Yagos, did I completely answer your question about the fees and how they work? Yeah, you did. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I think there's only a couple of people I haven't heard from here. Uh, so Lori, Brian, Mustafa, if you have any questions, I believe my email will be circulated to you afterwards. We will have a recording of this. Should you want to listen to it again, so if you apply online, we can set up an intro call and go over any sort of specific details you want to about your business and how it might give more sight. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, for a really good overview. I already talked to you a few weeks ago and um, I am applying. So Great. looking forward to going further. Fantastic. Okay, application deadline, March 25th. Thank you all for your time. It's a Friday afternoon. I'll let you all go. Hopefully talk soon.